Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, Thursday, February 2nd, 2023. And welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning, Gene Lawler and I are delighted to host another cutting edge webinar for mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, and anybody who negotiates. As you all know, there's no charge for these great programs. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank if they like what they see. And one of my favorite parts of the program every week is when we announce the running total of just how much our generous audiences have contributed in honor of our great speakers. Jean Lawler, would you do the honors, please? A pleasure as always. Um, yes. So the running total as of today, and these are donations about which people have told us. I'm sure there's much more out there, but this is an amazing number, 360,000. So that's 360 and $6.40. So that's uh, with the LA Food Bank at 25 meals per dollar approximately, others averaging maybe 10 meals per dollar. That's anywhere from four to 9 million meals. That's great. And, and upwards, we're counting for more, right? Amazing. Thank you so much, Jean. And today we have another great presentation. I'm confident that will generate much more in contributions. We're very happy to have with us this morning, Dorian Slater Thomas. Dorian practices at the law firm of Frankfurt, Kernet, uh, uh, Frankfurt, Kernet and Sells in Los Angeles, Frankfurt, Kernet, Klein and Sells in Los Angeles. He practices in the firm's interactive entertainment group and the Advertising, Marketing, and Public Relations Group, where he handles a wide range of transactional work for prominent agencies, brands, platforms, developers, publishers, and individual creative talent. The National Law Journal's 2022 Trailblazers list included him for sports, gaming, and entertainment. Law and Variety included him as an Up Next honoree in their 22 Legal Impact Report. The Legal 500 has listed him as a rising star in advertising and marketing in 2021. Mr. Thomas has experience advising some of the world's best known gaming and technology companies, including developers and publishers in the interactive entertainment industry. He has negotiated and drafted development and publishing agreements, licensing agreements, software agreements, and operational agreements across various digital media platforms. Mr. Thomas also negotiates and drafts advertising and marketing services agreements, whether in the interactive entertainment industry or otherwise. He regularly handles creative services agreements, talent, spokesperson, endorsement, and influencer agreements, sponsorship and promotion agreements, branded entertainment agreements, agency and management agreements, production agreements, license agreements, and releases. We are delighted that he's made the time with all those agreements being drafted to present to us. Dorian is a tremendous expert on the video game industry, which is bigger than the motion picture and music industries combined. So to tell us about video game law, drafting contracts and dispute resolution, we're delighted to have Dorian join us we hope that people will be able to contribute to the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank in Dorian's honor or another food bank of your choice wherever you live or wherever it's important to you. We appreciate it very much. Dorian Slater Thomas, with that said, my friend, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. That was a kind introduction. And thank you, Jean and Natalie, for having me and for um, spearheading this, you know, wonderful cause and initiative. So I'm um, honored to be a part of this. So thank you all. Um, I am a technology attorney, but sometimes have technology issues. So let me share my screen and you all let me know if this is going to be useful. Let's see here. All right, so um, I won't spend too much time talking about me since we have that great <laughs> introduction. Thank you, Jeff. Um, but just real quick to sort of reiterate some points. I'm Dorian, nice to meet you all. Um, 
Uh, I am at Frankfurt Kern at Klein and Sells. I've been there for about five years. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I work in the interactive entertainment and advertising groups. In both sides, I tend to handle mostly talent production, influencer related um, agreements and counseling. Um, so typically, whether it's in the interactive entertainment industry or the advertising industry, I'm usually in the talent production angle as opposed to development, creation, et cetera. Um, began my career in New York, but I'm currently in LA and I kind of bounce back and forth between the two, but I'm happy to be in the West Coast. And um, I'm married, I have two dogs, and in my spare time when I have it, I love to do yoga here in LA. There's a lot of great yoga out here. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have had the opportunity to enjoy that as well. So um, what is interactive entertainment? I think it's a good starting point to sort of talk about what the industry is and what it might capture because it is an incredibly broad industry for sure. Okay, now do we see what is the metaverse? What is the metaverse? Okay, great. Um, all right, so how, let's let's really test the technology. And if we go backward, do we see eight tiles of different? All right, yes. great. So this is what I was talking about. We have Ariana Grande or Ariana Grande, excuse me, in the top left, Texas Ta Chainsaw Massacre, which is maybe what folks might consider as a more traditional video game. Here, this is uh, what we might be dealing with is the development agreements and public uh, publication agreements for a publisher who's publishing this video game. Obviously here, there were also IP rights that had to be licensed from an existing IP entity. Here was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre chain. So we might be involved in all of that, whether it's the development agreements or the licensing agreements for the particular um, uh, here video game. The next tile over, this woman here is Pokimane. She's one of the more famous um, gamers and streamers on Twitch. Um, essentially, individuals will stream their gameplay, which is essentially allowing people to watch them playing games virtually, right? And then also comment and kind of engage with these players. Um, so in this instance, we might represent the particular streamer like a talent. Um, and we might also engage with them on like the brand side. If people want to sponsor this particular talent or if they want her to play a particular video game, we can help negotiate and pay for those agreements as well. Uh, on the top right here is Nike Land in Roblox. Roblox is another one of these um, metaverse-like um, gaming platforms that's available. Um, here, it might be you know, papering this branded space within the metaverse. Here, Nike having its own space within the metaverse, which is actually huge. I think they've already surpassed 70 million visitors in this digital space. And within this space, you can, you know, don your own avatar with Nike gear. Um, so we might help with the branding of this space, negotiating those agreements, papering those agreements, as well as thinking through some things like codes of conduct while you're in this space, which is super important for brands, right? Like they want to create a safe space for users that are entering into these branded experiences. Uh, bottom left, uh, Beat Saber is one of Oculus VRs, which is one of the, you know, total VR headset um, games. We might help with the development of a particular Beat Saber version or iteration. We might also help here, The Weeknd, who is another musician, um, engage in licensing a music pack. So essentially, you can enter into the Beat Saber Weekend music pack and through Beat Saber play through this particular artist's various tracks. And that obviously would require negotiation with the artist as well as publishers, labels, et cetera. Um, I mentioned the TikTok Creator Fund here. Um, there are a lot of creator initiatives just generally in interactive entertainment right now, whether it's TikTok or Fortnite or Twitch, or essentially there's a big movement to for these platforms to be incentivizing creators to create on the platform and continue to bring users and eyeballs. So we might counsel the platforms how to legally structure engaging with these creators and incentivizing them. Um, now we have a, a Fortnite phase clan um, a, a team. We might help uh, with the management essentially of an esports team. And this might be a team of players who play in these battle royale games, meaning multiplayer games, and there's tournaments for these games. And so we might help structuring and managing the team itself, and then also a big piece of team revenue is going to be brand sponsorship. So oftentimes we'll be involved with their sponsorship agreements with the esports team um, and a particular brand. And then the bottom right tile I think is super in interesting. It, for most of my career, when we're doing licensing agreements in video games, it's typically video games licensing existing IP from studios or streamers 
But now we're starting to see the opposite happen where we're having very popular video games that are then being licensed to be like, in this case, a limited series um, streaming show. So it's kind of the opposite flow of the license. And I think it just goes to show like the continued popularity that video games are having where now they are becoming the source of some of the more traditional entertainment IP as opposed to the other way around. So a lot of info here, but essentially just trying to capture like the broad swath of what is interactive entertainment. Um, me and my team might be involved in all of these various types of work with these various entities and individuals. So it's a pretty big space. All right, now to the slide I think we've all seen, defining the metaverse. So I've said a couple of metaverse, you know, related platforms like, so what is the metaverse? And there's lots of talk about the metaverse right now, right? So in my personal opinion, the metaverse singular does not exist. We have many entities out there that are working on their own iterations of what might be the metaverse. But as of right now, we don't have one singular metaverse that I think some people may be conjuring in their minds. Essentially, the metaverse is a term that was first coined in Neil Stevens, uh, Stevenson's 1992 sci-fi novel, Snow Crash, where he starts talking about this uh, metaverse place. I think the sort of the more recent iteration is if you think of Ready Player One, that was also an, <clears throat> excuse me, a novel and a popular movie in the last couple of years that really shows this immersive digital environment that essentially is now the commute, like where you know, it's the town hall, the public square, it is where the community lives, right? Within a singular virtual space. There might be separate spaces within that virtual space, but it is the one singular metaverse that we're all interacting in. Again, that one single space where we're all interacting does not exist yet, but there are um, several platforms that are working towards one. Um, one is Fortnite, which is a battle royale gaming universe, but now it's just sort of also a place where people generally hang out. Roblox is a huge one, particularly for some um, younger generations. And then there are also some of these metaverse platforms that are working towards on-chain, which means like blockchain related technology. Um, just a quick note on blockchain. Um, my firm does have a blockchain and Web3 group that deals with blockchain related issues, including NFTs or otherwise issuing digital assets. Um, I would say though that um, the metaverse and blockchain are not synonymous. They do not necessarily need one another. There are most of the metaverse-like platforms that we have available out there, including Fortnite and Roblox, do not have on-chain assets. They don't have NFTs. They're not really interested in venturing into that space. So I think there's a common misconception that the metaverse must be blockchain-based. I think that you know, ultimately, what if there is a singular metaverse, it may have blockchain technology um, integrated into it or available with it, but it's not necessarily dependent upon one another. Um, so when we talk about the metaverse, it's still something that doesn't quite yet exist. The best sort of um, corollaries that we have at this point in time are going to be more like the Fortnites and the Robloxes of the world. So, um, this is a little bit of a smattering of some topics about um, the metaverse. And um, I think that they might be good jumping off points for questions or discussions. So please feel free to raise your hand or submit a comment or even just speak up. I don't mind being interrupted. That's that's totally fine by me. But I think some of these issues that I'm going to raise might be interesting to those who are mediators, arbiters, or just general lawyers in the space that it's it's some of the bigger concerns that we're thinking through in the metaverse as well as some particular concerns that relate to dispute resolution. So that's kind of the perspective that I'm coming from. Um, this certainly does not capture all of the particular issues within the metaverse, right? Um, but it's just one of the pieces, you know, several pieces that I think could be good jumping off points for discussion. All right, so a big piece that we've been focusing on is trying to determine what the ownership structure of intellectual property within the metaverse or current existing metaverse like platforms might look like. So if you're in the metaverse where you're building this digital space, right, and you yourself can occupy a space in the metaverse, like having your own metaverse apartment or storefront or plot of land, you would assume, or I mean, in reality, that would be something that you would either lease from a landlord or own, right? 
And that's essentially the structures that we have available to us as well in digital assets. We can either license these digital spaces and digital assets to individuals, or they can own them. Some platforms have tried to pursue the ownership path. Um, I think just practically speaking and from a liability standpoint, ownership has proven to be very difficult particularly because if you are allowing people to own digital assets, it's going to be hard to enforce whatever the codes of conduct or other community standards or even terms of use that you might have for these particular individuals without um, a strong enforcement mechanism. If you're allowing individuals to own these digital assets, you can't necessarily take them away from them or suspend access to those assets without you know, having like a takings claim or some other um, you know, uh, whether it be like a property tort or something, um, it essentially opens yourself up to liability, most of which the platforms aren't willing to consider. So all, long story short, most platforms now um, move towards like a license-based model. So even when you are purchasing, say like an avatar or a t-shirt for an avatar or something like that, you are not actually owning that particular digital asset. You have a license to use that asset. If you look at the commercial terms or the EULAs that are there for the particular game or metaverse, you'll see that that's a very clearly a licensed structure. Um, unfortunately, I think we're doing a disservice in the industry and in marketing. I think lots of times when you see these marketing initiatives that are highlighting these digital assets or digital spaces that are available to users, oftentimes they use language like buy now or own your, you know, your skin or your gun or this you know, particular digital house. So I, I do think that uh, that the industry itself, um, unfortunately, and, and probably inadvertently, is is confusing consumers and users. Um, so that's also a big sort of one of my own personal initiatives when I'm counseling on the, in this space is not just advising on legal terms when we're drafting or looking at EULAs or license agreements to access, you know, metaverse and buy or or lease or license digital assets. Really hounding home to the publisher or the platform that we need to be clear how we're marketing these assets to individuals so that we don't confuse them and hopefully then alleviate the concern of having disputes in the future, right? We also have to think about third-party content that might be um, in the metaverse itself, um, either through users bringing in their own third-party content, like say they have a space and then they upload music to that space, um, who's responsible for clearing that music, right? Like, is it going to be the platform itself or is it going to be the particular user? And how would you enforce a claim against that particular user? Um, you know, to, speaking to some of these uh, platforms and developers, it, it would be easier from a liability standpoint for them just to shift the liability to the user for being liable for whatever content they upload. Um, but then really thinking through it, I oftentimes have to say on the phone, you can't squeeze blood from a stone, right? So you can insert a liability or indemnification provision on a user, but if that particular user has no assets and you get an IP infringement claim that's seven hundred thousand dollars, how are you actually going to seek relief in that instance, right? Like on paper, yes, but practically no. Um, so it's really important for the platforms themselves to be thinking through this and see what burdens they need to take on. Even though you know from a paper standpoint they may not want to do as such, I think practically speaking, it's going to be ultimately the best way for the platforms to proceed. This is also important for brands to take a look at because many platforms have, particularly in the music standpoint, have engaged in these broad license agreements with record labels and publishers. But typically if they do that, it's only for user generated content that's non-commercial in nature. So as soon as you have like a commercial venture within one of these metaverse like spaces, whether it's like, just for example, like the Nike store within Roblox, if they're playing music at that Nike store, it's unlikely that, um, Roblox's broad license agreement with record labels and publishers would cover a commercial action, right? So then it would be up to that Nike in this instance to obtain the necessary um, permissions and licenses from labels and publishers to then have music within that space. So it gets a little bit complicated if your clients are actually commercial entities having commercial initiatives within these metaverse-like spaces, because not only do you have to think through what the issues there are from a licensing or third-party content standpoint, but then you really have to weed through the particular platform terms because they may only apply to users in a non-commercial context, and generally that's true. So um, relatedly, and I think importantly to this group, I, I wanted to bring up this case, this Bragg versus Linden. It's a little bit older, it's from 2007, but it's so one that we bring up quite a bit in the space. 
essentially this concerns um, one of these metaverse like um, gaming spaces that was out there that was called Second Life. Um, Second Life has actually had a second life recently and has come back into popularity, but it was particularly popular in the early 2000s. Um, and it was really one of the very first spaces that kind of had this virtual community where not saying that there was no point to the game, but you can go and interact in this space like you would almost in reality, right? Like you could have a house and you could buy property and you could, you know, sell items and really sort of engage virtually much like you would in the real world. Um, Second Life distinguished itself in the beginning by saying that, yes, you can actually own your digital assets here. Like you will own the land that you purchase within Second Life, or you will own, you know, if you create, like in this instance, the um, plaintiff here created uh, fireworks, basically, that other users could buy within Second Life and then have fireworks on their property or, or at their home. And so Second Life itself actually advertised and in its terms so that you would own this land. Um, now, what had happened was this uh, particular plaintiff here had purchased, was quite a prevalent user within Second Life, had purchased several um, properties or plots, digital plots here, um, and essentially through this purchasing, ended up purchasing a plot that for kind of convoluted reasons was under dispute. And essentially Second Life came to him and said, this particular piece of land that you think you have purchased, there's a dispute with who actually owns this, and so you no longer own this. Um, and then denied access, um, brag access to that particular plot. And through a few other alleged community violations or community standard violations, then ceased allowing Bragg to have access to Second Life, period. So Bragg brought suit um, and the base of his claims was essentially like he had paid for all of this land and all these digital assets. Um, and he was told that he owns them. And so essentially he was prohibited from you know, using the property that he believed he rightfully owned. So in bringing this suit, Second Life responded and said, oh, by the way, the user terms of service that you click through have an arbitration provision, which says we must first arbitrate this dispute. And um, Bragg disputed that arbitration uh, provision and the applicability of the arbitration provision to this particular dispute. And this is something that comes up now frequently with us because we draft tons of terms of service. And I'm sure all everybody here has clicked through, you know, every time you go to a website, it feels like, right? Like you agree to our terms of service, you agree to our privacy policy. There might be a cookie policy. Um, it's not the most sexy part of my job, but I hate to say it, and you know, maybe I'll be, you know, a target after this. But I'm one of the people who helped draft those terms. I may be one of the only people in the world who actually reads all of these terms. But it is a full industry out there of really drafting what these EULAs are. Side note, and one thing that I am super proud of that I think the industry, particularly the gaming industry, is moving towards are very readable, legible terms of service. So they're not meant to be, be these big, bulky legal docs they're really trying to communicate in a very colloquial clear way what the terms of entering into the game and and um, interacting with the game would mean um, and that's one of the things that i do in my practice is really trying to work on humanizing the terms but that's my side note in this instance you know to cut to the chase the terms were not humanized <laughs> they were they were very much early 2000 terms that were very heavy legal i'm sure there was latin in there um, and they were very, you know, tight text, like little font, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, I think something like provision 13 under miscellaneous was this arbitration provision. And in looking through these terms here, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania was essentially saying that this clearly by just putting up these set of terms that were super dense and just saying you must click essentially in order to access the game, that it was a contract of adhesion and that was unconscionable and unenforceable. So the terms themselves were already, uh, you know, subject. It was questionable as what any of the terms could be enforceable, let alone just the arbitration provision. So because of that, you'll notice now there are lots of different mechanisms um, for it, consenting to terms online, right? Um, essentially, like the standard now is being very clear that you are, it's a pop-up window or some sort that's being very clear that you're, you know, entering into an agreement. They typically are unchecked boxes so that you have to affirmatively check the box so that there's a claim that you're affirmatively giving your consent to the terms. And also, I think some of the more prudent or well-crafted terms will not only say that you're consenting to these terms, excuse me, it's trash day and the trash truck is going by the house. Um, not only are you consenting to these terms, but they will also pull out some of the more pertinent terms and clearly and boldly like say, these are included in the terms to which you're agreeing, right? And one of those provisions that you'll see most often is an arbitration provision. So it may not be the full arbitration provision when it's kind of this click through box, right? 
but it, it, it might say something like, you know, in bolded font, like the terms of service include like a mandatory arbitration provision or something of the sort. And so that way it's, it's hopefully trying to make it more of a, a clear understanding of what users are um, entering into. And hopefully then, you know, if there were to be an issue that the terms would be found not to be unconscionable and to be enforceable. Um, also, the court talked about this element of surprise, and this is kind of what I was alluding to as well, is that essentially the, the arbitration provision and some of the other beefier legal terms are really hidden within the document. Um, so again, now you'll see oftentimes if I think that they're well drafted or well presented, that some of the more pertinent terms will be displayed to the users, you know, when clicking through. And then also when you're looking into the terms, you might see that they're oftentimes bolded, they're all caps, they might be underlined, they might be in a bigger font, like really trying to better highlight that these are like meaningful terms. I would say that all of the terms in, in terms of service are meaningful, that's why they're there, but really the ones that have been found to be some of the more onerous on users. And so that way they're really highlighted and available. Another big piece is unilateral terms. If, if the terms themselves are just clearly one-sided, um, then that's gonna be one thing that's gonna be difficult for a court that if they're looking from this unconscionable perspective to really feel like they are conscionable terms if they're clearly just one-sided. Um, so it's been, it, I think it's been really great to see in lots of ways, um, particularly again in the gaming space, like how these platforms and developers are really wanting to make their terms as palatable to users as possible, which can be interesting from a lawyer's perspective, right? Because sometimes I'm, you know, I just go in and I'm just there to get the best terms for my client and get in, get out. That's all we're doing, right? And here it really is having to come at it from a bilateral mind and really think about, all right, I need to find what is most important, where the biggest risks are to my client to make sure that we're, if my client's the video game in this instance, to make sure that they're protected. But we also need to make sure that the user is a part of this process as well, so that we're not having these unilateral terms and these terms themselves are found to be unconscionable. And it's been great to see like some of the instances in which you know platforms are willing to be more um, friendly to users. Um, I think the big piece is just gonna be communication with users and making clear, um, again, like what they actually own or don't own. Um, also, if their access is being suspended, what community um, terms are like, codes of conduct. So there's really some of these places that we can make it, you know, a hopefully more unilateral and, oh, excuse me, more bilateral and mutual and also more friendly and visible to the users. So hopefully we don't have an unconscionable so term. So Dorian, yeah. excuse me, are you suggesting that a user could email somebody and say, before I agree to your terms of service, I'd like some modifications here. Is that what you're suggesting? I well, sure. I I'm sure somebody could do that now. Um, and I, depending upon the platform, I I would be interested to see like how robust a response you would get. I think most likely it would be like it, we're happy to answer the response would be we're happy to have, answer any questions you have about our terms. But because of the nature, like we these are our you know set terms and and basically the point there is that if we have millions upon millions or maybe even billions of users, we can't have billions of separate different license agreements out there. It would just be just unattainable to like manage all of those rights and the differences between the two. Where you might have some more leeway if you're like, hey, I'm Walmart and I want to enter into your mm -hmm. space. And now there is a Walmart land in Roblox. And I guarantee you that there were terms that were negotiated for Walmart store within that place. So it, you individual users, probably not. Larger brands, definitely. There's a whole licensing scheme that works with them that's separate from the Yule agreement. Yeah. All right. So a few other things that I think are interesting to talk about, um, and relatedly, thank you, it's a good transition. Um, if you're contracting, particularly if there's some kind of license agreement within the metaverse, right? Um, so maybe you are having a particular IP, like maybe there's a, I don't know, like a, like a full house, from the 90s, if you all remember that show, uh, full house world in Roblox, right? And so we would need to license the particular IP from the owners of full house. Um, what might be difficult in the metaverse is typically like in the real world, right? Like if it was just a movie uh, that we were creating based off full house, like we could limit the territory to like the movie will only be, you know, distributed in the United States, right? What is the territory of the metaverse? If the metaverse is meant to be accessed, you know, from around the world or even the universe, I guess, theoretically, like how would you define the term territory? It could be difficult, right? Like would you define the term of territory dependent upon like you are only allowing users based on their IP addresses from certain territories in accessing 
the content in the metaverse, it gets it gets technical and tricky fast. Um, similarly with media, how would you define, typically when you are licensing IP, like again, for a movie, we would define the media as like, I don't know, cinematic film or long form cinema, you know, full feature, full length feature or something like that. What is the metaverse as a type of a media? Like it's not yet a fully established, like well-known media. I feel like streamers might've had a similar issue when they first started coming out, right? Like when we were licensing IP to the Netflixes of the world, there was a little bit of skittishness, like is streaming really, like can't people download that? Like we just didn't understand the tech, right? So there were lots of issues of whether or not people really wanted to license their IP to streaming. That's all old hat now, right? Now streaming in some ways is much larger than traditional cinema or broadcast. So maybe the metaverse will proceed in the same way, but it's again, trying to think through some of these terms that we use in typical license agreements that kind of take on a whole new perspective in the metaverse, just based on the fact that the metaverse is this new tech. It's also gonna be difficult if we're working under existing license agreements, right? Like if we already have existing license agreements, um, what are we, how would those be interpreted to the metaverse, right? Now we might see license agreements for some of these big IPs that say um, internet and new media. You have the right to use this IP and internet and new media. I would, I think some would argue, particularly the, the IP owners that were licensing that, that internet and new media meant like streaming and social media, not necessarily the metaverse, right? So, it, but if I were the gaming platform, I might argue that internet new media does capture the metaverse. So it's also gonna take some thinking through of existing contracts, like do those capture metaversal uses or not? Um, so really with this new tech, it's really figuring out not only how we're gonna approach license terms going forward, but also how we're gonna approach existing license terms to the extent they apply to the metaverse. Now, Another interesting topic that is happening a lot is interoperability of content. And essentially, the, the idea here is that if you buy, here gonna be licensing, but if you purchase a license to say a Nike pair of shoes in one area of the metaverse, can you use those shoes across all areas of the metaverse, particularly if they are hosted or owned by other entities? So essentially, it's like if you have a license to your Nike shoes in the U.S., which we buy, but as soon as you buy your shoes, you can wear them wherever you want, right? But in the in the world, in reality, but in virtual reality, as soon as you purchase a digital asset, in order to move that across different servers or into different other entities within the metaverse, you would then have to essentially like re-enter into a new digital space, which may have its own digital terms, which may have its own exclusivity which may not have license agreements with the particular, you know, in this instance, Nike from which you bought the product. So really how will we be able to create these licenses that will allow products to be moved across spaces um, within the metaverse or other digital realities? We're not sure. The, the end of the day, the question is, we're not sure how this would work. Really what we need to do is just have the tech get there first. This is one of this interoperability question is like, like what legal nerds love to nerd out on at these metaverse legal conferences. But at the end of the day, the real answer is, is that we still have to wait for the tech to catch up because right now we don't have the tech that's there that lets you take, say, your Nike shoes from Fortnite and wear those same Nike shoes in Fortnite in Roblox. Roblox and, and Fortnite are totally different entities, right? Like they're non-congruent. Like you can't go back and forth with the same avatar, the same character, the same assets. Eventually, the, if there were one metaverse, that's what you would be able to do. Right. Um, so we can't yet draft for that until we know what the tech actually does and how the tech works. It's a cool idea to think about, like how we might capture for an interoperable license. Um, but again, we're sort of waiting for the tech guys to figure it out first. Um, but it is kind of a nice dinner conversation if, you know, if that's your subject <laughs> that you like to, to have. Maybe not a nice dinner conversation, but in my house, it is one. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, I know I've been talking a lot and probably talking fast, um, but if there are any questions, please let me know. Um, another huge piece of this now, um, but I think would also be um, interesting to those who are kind of involved in the dispute resolution process is going to be content moderation. Um, so there may, you all might have heard of some content moderation issues, just even on like Facebook, for example, right? How there's just been difficulty moderating tons of content on Facebook and removing, you know, content that could be like harmful to other users, violation of Facebook's um, code of conduct, et cetera, et cetera. 
And some, while some of it is done with AI, there's also a lot of it that's done with human power. And it really is not only a difficult and arduous task, but there's also issues with content moderators themselves. Like, are they getting mental health um, services? Like, are they getting, you know, days off? Like essentially some of the stuff that they have had to see on the internet and take it down can be so disturbing that is actually, you know, harmful to content moderators. So just the idea of content moderation is difficult. And if we extrapolate that out to essentially a universal metaverse where billions of people could have access, how in the world would we be able to moderate all of those users' behavior and what content they might be publishing? So it's really a nightmare from like a content moderation standpoint. Um, what I was kind of talking to is just sort of the scope of moderation, like how would we even be able to moderate those many folks? Um, but it's also even just thinking like from a, again, from more of like a lawyerly perspective, like how would we go about drafting a set, a code of conduct that would apply to the world, right? Like right now, our codes of conduct, particularly are, are very territorially based and also in my argument, like culturally based, right? Like we may not prohibit like alcohol um, in certain areas of the metaverse here, but if we're in countries where alcohol is like prohibited or against certain religions, they certainly would not want to have alcohol in their versions of the metaverse, right? Or if we're even thinking about like religious wear, or gender differences, or expressions of sexual identity, like how would we be able to establish a uniform set of code of conduct that would apply throughout the metaverse? Or conversely, would we have to then have separate codes of conduct for like, this part of the metaverse is like, I don't know, like uh, whatever, like the North American version of the metaverse where like our general laws, rules and customs apply. And over here is a different version where their laws, rules and customs apply. Um, and then what happens if users like sort of cross borders between within the metaverse? Like it really is a difficult idea to think of how will we establish what the metaverse like laws and rules will be and who will enforce them? I like to joke like, are we going to have metaverse police, right? Like if we have all these avatars walking around out there, are we actually going to have like police like avatars also walking through the metaverse to try to see if you know you're acting in accordance with with the codes of conduct or whatever other terms would apply i think it's also really important just to think about exclusivity or uh, and inclusivity here too um are we going to allow for broad forms of expression via avatars within the metaverse i think this is very tech dependent too like what the tech will actually allow us to do but are people going to be able to express themselves as they would like to? And if they are not, is that then prohibition or omission of allowing them to express themselves somehow discriminating against them? So there's lots of sort of discrimination issues to think of, particularly if we're thinking of this as like the public commons or the public square, like are we somehow discriminating against individuals here? But what would be an example of that, Dorian? Sure, so for example, if you only have white male avatars, um that means like the only avatar that's available for you in the metaverse is a white male is that somehow then discriminating against all individuals who are not white males um and then that be extra like how would you even then define like the myriad rainbow that we are as a race like as race like how would you define different versions of race and would you just i almost think of like one of those beautiful pinwheels right where you can select your color even if you want to be like blue or pink or red or whatever maybe that's ultimately the solution um, but really just sort of thinking through like what options are presented to users, um, would that somehow be discriminating? Also, we have to think about accessibility issues, right? Like um, this is, happens a lot with websites like ADA accessibility, right? Like um, what about the visually or hearing impaired? Will they be able to access the metaverse and interact in the metaverse? And again, thinking if the metaverse really is this place where like commerce is happening um, life events are happening, so not having access to the metaverse may significantly affect you negatively from either a financial or social perspective. If you don't have access to the metaverse, how would that cut you off from society, right? So how are we going to allow users who are hearing impaired or visually impaired to access the metaverse, and what would their experience be like? So we're really working through a lot of these, not only like content moderation pieces, but also like diversity and inclusion issues to see if we are craft if the metaverse will be crafted in a way that will capture everyone. And from a legal standpoint, not inadvertently get people into trouble. Um, back to the enforcement piece, we've we've had some interesting discussions on enforcement, like how we how would we enforce codes of conduct in particular? Um, 
And there might even be things like warnings or cooldown periods, right? Like you as a user, if first of all, we're able to establish a set of codes of conduct, and then we're able to identify users who have violated those codes of conduct, what types of penalties or remediation might there be? And this would be like you receive maybe just a virtual pop-up warning or a kind of a cool down or a muting period where it essentially is like you are not able, you can still access the game, but maybe your avatar can no longer speak or maybe your avatar can no longer like purchase items for a set period of time. And that's essentially like your timeout for like violating these codes of conduct or terms of use. Um, there's also been discussion about whether there should be permanent or semi-permanent bans. Like maybe if you do something that's so egregious, like you need to be suspended for six months or a year, or maybe even permanently banned from the metaverse. Um, one of the issues with permanent bans too is how are we going to be able to pro prohibit somebody who gets permanently banned under one avatar from just creating a new avatar and entering into the metaverse again, right? Like how are we going to be able to track offenders in the real world so that they're not just like basically gaming the tech itself to continue to come into the metaverse and engage in these inappropriate behaviors. Behaviors. One of the more interesting ones that I've heard that was proposed is essentially like um, a community trial kind of, kind of perspective where basically if a bunch of users are in the same digital space, like one digital room, and there's a particular user who is engaging in conduct that violates the code of conduct, could a majority of those visual use users in the same space elect to like mute or kick out from that digital space the one person who was engaged allegedly like violating the codes of conduct right the pros of this would be that it allows users self-help and it particularly if content enforcement um content enforcement um mechanisms are slow or take time like it could more immediately address an issue or a problem behavior by a user but clearly the downside of this is this very much could just turn into a witch hunt, right? Like it could be one group of people who just decide they just don't want any women to come in or they just don't want this particular person to come in or it could really be used to be very exclusionary if we have this sort of like self-help tool that's available to users. But it's one of the ones that's being pitched around out there and it's gotten getting some traction and, and it's something to sort of think through. Maybe if there's a way to do it in a limited fashion, um, maybe it's a way to offer users more self-help in the immediate term. And then the final piece that we really hound home with any of these enforcement mechanisms is that we definitely feel that there should be appeals process um, so that really there's a way that users can either, you know, seek relief or maybe even defend themselves if they have a different um, story, which I think is going to be really important. Again, if we think of the metaverse as a place where people might be engaging in commerce, right? Like if you were to ban somebody or if you were to, they were for some reason to be, you know, receive a warning or somehow like publicly shamed even, and it's a commercial entity and that's where they make their livelihood by doing so could really hurt them from a financial standpoint right so it just goes beyond even like playing a game if we have these important submit mechanisms and there's not an appeal or review process and for whatever reason it's you know wrongly a person is wrongly accused or wrongly banned it could really detrimentally affect their life for no reason um so it's an interesting interesting one for us to think through Relatedly, kind of to the worldwide nature of all of this is what would happen when disputes within the metaverse need to be litigated, right? Will we have metaverse courts? Will they be heard by courts in the real world? How will that ultimately look like? And really importantly, what will the governing law be? What will the venue be, right? Like, will, you know, if we have one user who's in Korea and one user who's in Canada, like, where would they hear a real world dispute, right? And whose law would govern? Um, and maybe even more importantly, like, <laughs> would you be able to enforce a judgment on somebody in certain countries, right? Like, how would that even work? Um, sort of side note, and kind of a, a conversation that Jeff and I touched on a little bit earlier this week when we were discussing this presentation is that this comes up a lot, not only in the metaverse, but just in game development period. Um, game development is very much an, interna an international industry. So we have lots of developers and platforms that are working together in many different countries. And it's not unusual for us to get into a dispute with two parties who are located in different countries. And it can be extremely difficult to even bring a party to the table, either in arbitration or in litigation, particularly if we have no enforcement mechanisms in their country of residence or where they're located, right? How are we going to extradite somebody for a breach of contract claim? It's not going to happen. How are we going to be able to access their bank accounts to you know, essentially levy a judgment against them? That's not going to happen. So sometimes there is lots of risk here in engaging with these cross-border interactions because at the end of the day, how are you really going to enforce a contract against somebody who's not in the same country or jurisdiction as you? And Dorian, are you envisioning claims, potential claims by users against each other for, yes. as you mentioned, bullying behavior that might 
cross the line, at least under some jurisdictions laws into things like defamation, infliction of emotional distress? How, what would happen with those? Exactly. I think that there will, I think so there will certainly be claims against the platforms themselves from users, but I think there's the, it is rife for user versus user conflict. And some of that has already played out. You, you can Google and see, and it's, you know, it's, it's not a topic I love to dwell on, but it's one that I certainly have to think about. But there are places where people have really been, they feel like they've been insulted or even sexually harassed within the existing versions of the metaverse now, like a Roblox or a Fortnite. And it can be really disturbing, particularly to younger users who are, you know, they're, they're just younger users, right? And then to have these interactions with these people online can be really harmful. And I can see why people would want to bring claims against one another for some of these torts. And how would we go about enforcing those? The platform, what they could they could kick off the offending user, right? But really what, like, would there be criminal sanctions against the person, against the platform? I mean, I really think it, it is a place that as more people begin to interact digitally, we're going to have to figure out how to have strong community standards and enforcement mechanisms. Because if these places aren't safe, then the brands won't come in and start sponsoring these places. And, and there won't be then this big commerce that we're thinking is going to be here. If it's like the wild, wild west, we won't see the brands of the world hopping in and making this the place that people think the metaverse is going to be. So maybe there's room for an avatar mediator to set up a mediation shop. Has that happened or not uh, yet? But it's, arbitration, uh, anything like that? So no, not yet. In some of the, uh, and it's a great idea. Um, it all depends upon like, I think that would go through, well, but almost back to the top of the conversation is what authority would those arbitrators or mediators have over the disputes within the, in the metaverse, right? And that certainly if that could happen, if the terms of service, basically the users and, and platforms agree that disputes that happen within the metaverse for, should first be arbitrated and could be arbitrated within the metaverse itself, right? So I could see how we could structure that and have people agree to that form of mediation. Um, what I would note is that there's, um, we haven't talked about it that much, but as I sort of noted in the beginning, there are some of these blockchain based metaverses out there where you can buy like digital properties, right? And you might have heard that people like Nike has bought various digital properties and some other folks. There have been some law firms who have ventured in and purchased these digital properties. Now, they're not providing services within these digital spaces, but I think it is kind of indicating that people are thinking like ultimately if we have these universes where people are interacting like they do their daily lives, they're going to need the same professional services they, that they need in the real world, right? Which would include lawyering or mediating or arbitrating. And so I, I do think that it would be a conversation as these places grow, particularly as these codes of conduct and enforcement mechanisms are thought through and decided how we can get, you know, mediation into the, into the mix. And then for lawyers, that would raise all kinds of questions as to multi-jurisdictional practice, unauthorized practice of law in different territories. It's a, Fascinating. Are you proposing setting up the metaverse bar? Like and collecting we could, like the metaverse bar, and we can collect fees. And it, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's a you know, it's something certainly to think through. Um I think if there were a metaverse like dispute resolution process, that might be practically speaking, a more successful way in enforcing um judgments against individuals than in the real world right because then we're talking about maybe we could le levy their metaverse assets their digital assets mm -hmm. or something like that right or maybe we can more easily tie their ip address to a user maybe that's how we identify people as like ip addresses as opposed to avatars like that might be the better way to really nail down how we're going to practically identify parties and enforce judgments which i think you know is really the issue that we're struggling with now within the digital space but um, all right, so I see some questions popping in here. Let, let, let me ask yeah. one more, Dorian. What course. a lot of us are involved with the insurance aspects of different mm -hmm. disputes. What kind of insurance does somebody get, or do you recommend if you're going to become involved in this? If you're going to be a developer, if you're going to do business, transact business in the metaverse or right. if you are a platform? Sure, so good question. Um, some of it's still being figured out. Some of it is also, you know, it, it less and less so, but still if, at, at the end of the day, the Apples and the Googles and the Facebooks of the world self-insure, 
right? Like they, they have more money than God, as we like to say. So they're not necessarily concerned with having insurance to cover a claim in all instances because they have sufficient funds in the bank to cover it. That being said, they do have some insurance policies in some places. I think what's more important is brand and agencies and other um, branded aspects of the metaverse. Typically there, you'd want your standard sort of advertising errors and omissions insurance. I'd also say there's different cyber insurance policies that are available as well that could be useful here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I think it's gonna be more important to think about the commercial entities that are entering into these metaverse spaces than the metaverse platforms themselves with regard, with regard to insurance. Could be that some of these platforms decide that insurance might be useful in some instances, but as of now, they're just relying on their own bank, like their bank statements. Fascinating. I know we do have some questions in the chat. If yeah. people are comfortable just unmuting themselves and asking the questions out loud, that would be great. If not, we can read them. I'd agree. And maybe uh, actually you could turn um, your PowerPoint off and then everybody will be across the screen. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Let's see, yeah, since it's just questions. Okay. Here we go. Cool. So one question from uh, Richard Lutringer. What is the money trail? Is the business model based on user fees, advertising, or both? It's, uh, so most metaverse now are free to enter. Um, and so it really is the revenue or the money trail for the platforms themselves is advertising, 100%. Um, and then it's also for the places that have um, branded spaces within the metaverse. There it is selling digital, like it could be selling digital assets. There are lots of events that are happening within the metaverse, kind of back to the top of the call with like Ariana Grande performing in Fortnite. Like maybe there's a charge to access the event, right? So that's how the brands are ultimately making their money. Um, but really right now, what the meta, how the metaverse is making this money is for those branded spaces within the metaverse, they're charging the brands and that's essentially advertising, right? So it's basically back to like an advertising model. I also like to think of, oh man, what was that? Was it Minority Report with Tom Cruise that like where he popped in everywhere and that he had like that, like the glasses that they like recognized him and yeah, exactly. It was in his eye, right? Um, same thing. Like I wouldn't be surprised within the metaverse as you're walking around in the metaverse street that there are ads tailored to you um, for where, like wherever you're walking. You better believe that advertising is going to pop into the metaverse as soon as it can. It already is. Um, and then I think that also kind of goes back to the topic that we were sort of talking about is like, and we just saw some decisions with um, at least HUD and Facebook and um, advertising for housing. Like, are the platforms going to be engaged in targeted advertising, which ultimately could be discrimination? And is that going to be the end of targeted advertising? Not privacy concerns, but actually discrimination concerns, um, because by limiting the types of ads that people can see based on their um, biographic and other characteristics, are we engaging in you know discriminatory, discriminatory advertising, um, which is a possibility? Wow. So, Dorian, how much time do you personally spend in these different uh, worlds, Roblox, Fortnite? Sure. And what, what do you personally do there? Sure. If you're comfortable um, answering that. Yeah, I fortunately, I've, I've been able to spend less and less time in there. Um, I do have to, when I'm engaging with like a new piece of IP or having a new branded experience, I certainly go in to take a look and I'm, I'm coming at it very much from like a copy review perspective. I like rely on my advertising work actually. Like I go into this space and be like, are there third party rights in here that are not cleared? Like, are we, you know, is there something inappropriate in here? Like, how does the tech work? Is the user consenting, like before they enter to the space to a set of terms of service? Like, is there a contest involved? Are we getting all the promotion terms up to them? So I really come at it from like a very lawyerly perspective. So unfortunately, in some ways, it's kind of ruined a little bit of the entertainment perspective for me. Um, but I personally really like the music based experiences. They're really incredible because they have like a visual and interactive component with this like incredible music as well. So personally, when I'm involved, like that's that's where I'd like to go with them. Um, but fortunately, I've just because I've spent so much time in them, um, I've had to do that less and less. Um, but, you know, I think one related sort of concern that a lot of the platforms are thinking about is is there going to be a limited duration of time that people can actually spend in the metaverse, right? Um, they don't, they're thinking ahead of like how the tobacco companies and ph pharmaceutical companies are being sued in these major class actions for products that the companies allegedly knew were harmful. Do we know if spending, you know, 24 hours a day in the metaverse harms you in some way that the jury's still out on that one. 
And so the platform's already sort of thinking through that, like, do we want to be held liable for people who spend their full lives in the metaverse and ultimately scramble their brains for lack of better words, right? Or if that even happens. So there is thought as to, do we limit people's duration in the metaverse for health concerns? Um, so yes. you know, another like, aspect. Like in the advertisements for alcohol or casinos, where they put a disclaimer, if you need help with addictive behavior, yeah. call, call this or that number, yes. Yeah, yeah, it, it is something to think, of. and it's also tough from the platform perspective because it, it obviously the more users, the more eyeballs, the more brand revenue, the more app, like that's the model that's based on. So they want, as from a financial perspective, right? They want as many people in there as as long as possible. Um, so it's 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 interesting to see the platforms already having those conversations and really taking it seriously, knowing that if we limit people's duration within the metaverse, that it may prohibit the you know it may hinder the bottom line. Um, so, and we just have just a minute left, Dorian, a terrific presentation. If people want to know more or become more involved, are there certain things to read, things to do, organizations to join? Where do, where do you dive in? Yeah, so um, great. Great. I'll plug. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, please feel free to contact me. That's great. Um, there are also several law blogs out there that I think are great. Um, uh, Frank Kernet has an advertising one advertising blog that kind of touches on a few of these, but we also have a, an IP and media blog where we um, blog about um, recent topics and developments within the IE space. Um, if you're a lawyer, I think a great place for you to go is the Video Game Bar Association. Um, we have uh, quarterly meetings essentially, and we also have, you know, we share resources and, and discuss topics. So if this video game kind of IE space is for you and you're a lawyer, I would highly suggest you look into the Video Game Bar Association. Fantastic. Yeah. Dorian Slater Thomas, thank you so much. You and your law firm, Frankfurt, Kernet, Klein, and Sells PC are leaders in the field, and we're delighted that you spent the time to with us this morning explaining everything mm -hmm. so clearly, so comprehensively. If people are so moved, impressed by the presentation, if you're in a position to contribute, please consider the LA Regional Food Bank. We've posted the domain name the uh, the link for that in the chat if you're in a position to contribute to that that's wonderful or another food bank of your choice if you're kind that if you do contribute if you're kind enough to let us know about the contribution we will be very happy to add it to our total dorian slater thomas thank you natalie armstrong motan jean lawler thank you as well another wonderful presentation my friends and with that we are complete Thank you.